keeping track of your analyses and being able to revisit analyses when things like paper revisions come back or just actually being able to pass on your analyses to your colleagues. So Python and R are actually really well set up to do reproducible research and it's actually really easy. Um, some of you are probably implementing at least some of the parts of the workflow that I'm going to talk about um, in your work currently. So um, this talk will be at a really high level because we don't have that much time and it can get really detailed. Um, but I do actually have a blog, you can see the URL there, and it will be up on the last slide if you don't get time to write it down now or I can give it to you afterwards at the pub, just let me know. Um, I have two blog posts uh, which go into a bit more detail about how to implement some of this stuff. So feel free to visit and um, get guided through them that way. Um, also, I'm a really crazy cat lady, so there's going to be a lot of cats in this talk. Okay, so to start, what is reproducible research? So, as you can see in this quote that I got from Cran, reproducible research <coughs> is to tie together specific instructions to both the data analysis and the data that you're using in order to make sure that the scholarship or the work that you're doing can be recreated, better understood and verified. So, you know, this is a very high level aim. But it doesn't really give us a good idea of how we can apply reproducibility to our actual research. So to understand what this quote is trying to say, I think it helps to first outline what irreproducible research is. And before I, you know, say what this is, no judgment. I still do stuff like this, even though I know better. So let's say we're going back to an analysis we did six months ago. So we open up our Dropbox folder where we've got all of our analysis files. And you can see it's kind of a huge mess. So in this file, I have 30 different data sets, and I also have seven different Python analysis scripts. And I've given them a completely incomprehensible naming structure. I have no real way of knowing what is actually the most current working file. I'm going to take a gamble and open up what looks to be the most current file, the helpfully named life expectancy script, final three, final. And there's really not a lot here to guide me as to what my final analysis actually was and what my findings were. So it makes it really difficult when I pick this up again to start where I left off. I should also note that although this specific example is a Python analysis, um, those of you who are working primarily in R probably know that you can end up with the same sort of irreproducible analysis in R. And I know I have several of these types of folders on my computer right now. So, in order to be able to convert this piece of irreproducible research into something reproducible, I think we need to be able to answer five questions. What did I do? Why did I do it? How did I set it up at the time I did the analysis? When did I make changes and what were they? And who needs to be able to access it and how can I get it to them? So for this talk, I'll be using an example analysis. So all I've done is taken some um, data from the WHO website, and I've got about 150 WHO member countries, and I've just predicted the average life expectancy in these countries using a LASI regression. I've taken a few different predictions <coughs> from their um, data sets, including things like chronic and infectious disease prevalence and access to clean water and sanitation. So something that makes this a really nice case study for reproducibility is that each of the variables actually need to be downloaded separately and they're in really messy data frames, so you need to clean them and then merge them all into one data set to be able to actually run the analysis. So you can see that you need to have a really good handle on your uh, data access and data cleaning steps in order to be able to reproduce this analysis. <coughs> okay, so let's jump into how to convert our irreproducible analysis into something reproducible by answering our first question, what did I do? So one of the first things that can trip you up when you're working out where you, um, where you, what you're working on is where you got your data from. So you can see from this GIF, when you are downloading data from the internet, it's actually really hard to keep track of all the different steps that you might take. And you can really easily forget what you actually did when you come back to your analysis next time. So one of the best ways to get around this in both Python and R is to include your data download as part of your script. So you can see here we have a Python script, and I've used the pandas function read CSV to read the exact URL that I want into a data frame, 
And that eliminates any confusion that I have about what data I actually use. So similarly in R, in this example, I've used the um, get URL and text connection commands from the R curl package. And that calls in the same URL that I used in the Python example directly into a data frame. So I know R has a lot of different ways of accessing data. My default way is using the R curl package, but whatever your standard way of doing it is fine as long as it's documented in the script. And another important thing is when you're pulling data from the internet, make sure you note down the date that you pulled it in the script because data may change over time and that can be a possible tripping point. Another trap for reproducibility is when you edit data by hand. So it can be really tempting when you have a small data set and you think to yourself, well, I only need to do this once. We all know it's never just once. Um, and it's one of the hardest things to document properly. So you can see in this image, there's quite a few steps I've needed to take to reduce the life expectancy predicted data set <coughs> down to its final form, including keeping only a subset of rows, keeping only a subset of columns, and renaming things by hand. So again, the solution is to script any data manipulations that you do. So when you do this in Python, um, Pandas is again my go-to package. It has a really large range of functions for data wrangling, and it's really straightforward to couple both pandas commands and base Python commands to do all your standard um, data cleaning tasks. So in this script, I've written a function that does the same sort of thing that I was doing by hand. It keeps a subset of rows, it keeps a subset of columns, and it also cleans up any extra characters that might be in the numeric column, eliminates them and converts it to a numeric. So it means that it's really simple next time you come back to just run that and it'll do all the manipulation for you. It also means you've got a really clear document of what you actually needed to do to get your final data set from the raw data set. And the same principle, of course, holds in R. So here I've create created another function in R that does the same thing as the one in Python. Um, this one I was actually able to do it all using base R, because R is a bit more flexible when it comes to data manipulation. Um, of course, again, your approach may vary given that R has a lot of different functionality and packages for data wrangling. Um, I personally tend to stick to base R unless I need to do something a bit more advanced, in which case I'll pull in libraries, libraries like Stringer or Flyer um, for more advanced things. And finally, I think we've all been guilty of leaving exploratory code that we didn't end up using in the scripts when we walked away from the analysis. So it is kind of a pain when you get to the end of doing a huge piece of research and they have to turn around and clean up your code as well. But when you don't do so, it's really confusing when you come back later to work out what's actually important and what was used and what's not important and was discarded. So for example, in this Python script, I tried out both a bridge regression and a lasso regression. And in this untidy script, I've left both of them in. So it means that when I come back, I actually have no idea what my Obviously, that's not very helpful. So, the first step to understanding what you did is leave behind a tidy script with only those analyses that we used for your final report or whatever your end product was. So, it is a really boring step, but it's quite essential in reproducibility. Okay, so now we've worked out the what, we need to document why we did the things we did in our analysis. So as we all know, there's a whole bunch of decisions and assumptions you make when you do a data analysis that you'll never remember clearly when you're not in the midst of that project. So what sort of things might we not remember later? So why did I use these data? Why did I apply these specific transformations? Why did I pick this modeling approach? And most importantly, the question was I even trying to answer in the first place? So one way we can document this is by writing comments in our code. This works okay, but it's really difficult to read. And when you've got a lot of things that you need to write, it becomes extremely complicated and starts choking up your analysis script. So here I'm attempting to explain where I got each of my data sets from, for all my predicted variables and my outcome, and what subset I'm keeping in each. You can see it's not particularly consumable. So literate programming is an approach that's designed to get around this limitation of comments. Literate programs are an explanation of program logic in a natural language, in our case English, which is interspersed with snippets of your source code, in our case Python or R. 
Jupyter Notebooks are a really nice way of implementing literate statistical programs in Python. So for those of you who haven't heard of them, Jupyter Notebooks are documents that you run in your browser and they're really flexible. So they allow you to include and interactively run your Python code, but you can also include easily readable text, things like images, tables, and even dynamic visualizations using um, libraries like Plotly. So it means you can create documents that report on both the outcomes of your analysis, but also contain the Python code that you use to create that analysis alongside it. So you can see here an excerpt of a Jupyter notebook that I created for the life expectancy <coughs> analysis. At the top, there's a chunk of text explaining how I prepared this data set for modeling, and it uses markdown, which means you can add elements like titles and bullet points like I've done here, and it makes it much easier to read. And then, at the bottom is the chunk of code that goes with that part of the analysis. So it's really neat and very easy to consume. So when we revisit our data downloading sample, we can compare side by side how comments look compared to the text that you can create using Markdown in Jupyter Notebooks. So as we've already discussed, these inscript comments on the left are really hard to read, um, but they also make it really difficult to access the information we're trying to present. In the Jupyter Notebook, we've been able to create an explanation of what predictors we're keeping in an easy to read format because we can exploit things like a table feature, the table feature you can create in Markdown. Um, you can also do things like include hyperlinks, which means that not only is it taking up less space, it's also more useful because you can just click straight through to where you got your data set from. So what about R? Well, R has its own solution called R Markdown Documents. So these are a type of script that are available within R Studio, rather than being browser-based like the Jupyter Notebooks. So you can see here an R Markdown document with another chunk from the life expectancy analysis. In this example, I'm explaining the function from the previous section that I've used to clean up each of my data sets after I import them. And you can see that this example looks really similar to a Jupyter Notebook with the snippet of Markdown at the top and the accompanying code chunk at the bottom. So very similar. Um, however, the way that you use Jupyter Notebooks and R Markdown documents is a little different. So this is what an R Markdown document looks like under the hood when you're working on it. And you can see that at the top is our Markdown text, and at the bottom is the chunk of code. Um, and the code chunks are indicated by these back ticks and this little R in curly brackets. So anything inside that is interpreted by R as R code. So unlike Jupyter Notebooks, you can't run or render um, markdown or chunks of code cell by cell. You have to render the entire document to get that presentation form that I showed during the previous slide. And while this might seem a little bit inconvenient, um, I actually prefer markdown documents to Jupyter. My personal preference, I have been an R user longer than a Python user, um, but I found that they're actually a bit better for writing long documents. Um, so for example, a friend of mine and I have written an entire book using R markdown documents. I know people who've written theses and other books. So they're quite easy to use, but happy to hear any stories about Jupyter notebooks being used for long documents as well. That's my personal preference. Okay, so now we've documented what we did and why when we come back to it later. Now we would need to work out how we get around the next trap, which is not remembering how we set up our environment when we ran the analysis. All right. So let's say six months ago, we system installed all the packages we needed to run our analysis. And at the time, we installed the most up-to-date versions of whatever we used. So let's say in the Python analysis, we used NumPy, Pandas, and Matplotlib. But say we're doing it in R, we might use Flyer, Carrot, and ggplot2. So we ran our analysis <coughs> using this, and everything's worked beautifully. So now we come back to the analysis six months later, and things have moved on. All the packages are at different versions, and because we've been keeping everything installed globally and up to date, we now have a situation where our analysis relies on different package versions to what we have currently installed. So what happens when we try to run our analysis? Well, depending on the changes that are being made between versions, our code may not produce the same results, or it might not run at all. So Python, luckily has an easy and elegant solution, which are called virtual amps. 
So the way to think of virtual apps is they're essentially like your global environment, but instead of there only being one that affects all Python code run on your machine, you have many different and self-contained and disposable environments that are isolated from both each other and the global environment. So that means they can't see the packages that each of them have installed, and they can't see the packages that are installed globally. So you can see how useful these are when you have multiple projects that need different versions of the same packages, or you have packages that may not play nicely together and you don't want installed at the same time. So virtual apps do have a bit of a bad reputation of being extremely difficult to create. Um, however, the method that I use, which is doing it through a shell wrapper and running pip, is actually super simple. So I use a shell called fish, and I use a wrapper called virtual fish, and I'm going to demonstrate how simple it is to create a virtual M. So to initialize the virtual M, we simply type VF new, as you can see at the top, and name, in this case cats, my kids getting ahead of me. But you can see that I'm just pip installing the packages that I want to use. So pip install numpy, pip install pandas, and it's happily just doing a clean install in the virtual M, and pip install that problem. We don't need to wait for that. And when we list the packages, doing a pip list, we can see they're all there, and only they and their dependencies are there, nothing else. So my understanding is that many users of scientific Python use Anaconda instead. I'm not an Anaconda user, but I know that it does have its own dependency management system, and I would highly encourage you, if you're not using it, to explore it. I, I think it's very simple from what people have told me, so it looks like Harriet can probably give us a bit more detail after the talk. Okay, and of course virtual ends work really well when you're running the analysis on your own machine and you've got your virtual M created. But what about when you move to a different machine or you need to share your environment with someone else? So it's actually really simple to bundle up the contents of your virtual end using a process called freezing. So all we do, as you can see on the left, is type pip freeze and then assign the contents of the virtual end to a text file, cat's requirements. And then you can see everything's assigned here to this text file. And all you need to do is, when uh, you need to use it, you create a new virtual M, um, allow it to read the pack uh, contents of your requirements file, and it will recreate your environment. It's extremely simple. OK, so R, of course, has a similar problem. And I was confessing this uh, before the talk started. It's really weird. I've been an R user a lot longer than a Python user, as I said. And when I first started using Python, I was using virtual M's and best practice and being really good. But when I was talking to Harriet after my Python talk, I was like, you know, I don't know how to do dependency management in R. She's like, oh, you should look into Python. I'm like, I haven't been doing dependency management in R. So you can see here on the left, here's a whole bunch of stuff I've just system installed in my system library. And I've been doing this for years. And I'm like, that's actually terrible. I've been running into so many problems and then having to do hacks under the hood to try and fix it. Terrible. Now I'm changing my ways and I'm moving on to dependency management, which I'll explain to you. And it's really easy and I feel like an idiot for not doing it sooner. So, R has a library called Pacra. And Pacra does a really similar thing to virtual ends. In that when you're within a Pacra environment, any packages that you install will only be available to your Pacra environment and um, your analysis cannot access anything outside the Packrat environment, including things installed globally. So you can see here, I've got a Packrat library where everything's been installed specifically to that environment, and they are separate from those that I've system installed. So it is really simple if you're an RStudio user, which I assume probably most of you are. Um, what you need to do is just basically create a new RStudio project. And when you're prompted to name your project, all you need to do is tick this box here that says use Packrat with this project, and then give it a name. Click OK, create project. And it will basically initialize a new project that's using Packrat. And anything that you collect, um, any time that you write install packages while within that project, it will only install it locally. 
So again, we face a similar problem as we do with virtual ends, that when we move to a different machine or we need to share um, our project with a collaborator, they need to be able to access our pack rate environment. So if you have created the pack rate environment as part of an RStudio project, all you need to do is share the directory, <coughs> the directory that contains your um, R project. Then when they open the R project on their machine, it will automatically install all of the dependencies and the versions that you use. So you can see here on the left, basically I've done a fresh install of this life expectancy project that I created. And it's detected that it's a pack rat project. And it's starting at the bottom there to just automatically install all of the dependencies. Okay, so in the process of creating our lovely, clean, well-documented script, we generate a lot of code that we're not going to use later, but we might want to keep it or we want to keep track of changes that we've done. Um, so how do we do this in a useful and reproducible way? So as I showed you at the beginning of this talk, keeping track of changes can be really messy. So I showed you in the Python um, analysis, I've got six different versions of my script for this analysis, and I've got no real net way of knowing what's useful code in each of those versions and what's junk. So, fortunately, I have a better way for you. So, the way to manage your changes most effectively is something called version control. And I use a system called Git. Um, I understand that a lot of Python users use Mercurial. The principle is the same, so you don't need to change your version control, just as long as you are using version control. So what Git does is it takes snapshots of your coding points in time and allows you to compare the changes you've made between different versions or go back to an earlier version if you really don't like the change that you've made. So let's illustrate this with a diagram. So let's say we've got the current version of our script. What we do with Git is we commit the current version of our script to a local repository or repo. Um, and it's, this is essentially just a special type of folder that keeps track of changes that we make to our script. We can also push this version to a remote repo in order to make sharing with others easier, but I'll cover that in the next section of the talk. All right, so we get back to working on our script and we make some changes, as you can see here. We then commit this new version to our local repo and then subsequently our remote repo. So as you can see, is that instead of overwriting the old version, Git treats the new commit as the current version, but keeps track, to the track of the changes that have been made from the old version in the background. So let's have a look at how this looks um, in an, an analysis. For the life expectancy analysis, I've made three commits, and I should say that's far less than I should have made. I'm really bad at remembering to do commits. Um, but as you can see, you can make these commits, and when you do it, you can assign meaningful messages. So, say for example, finish literate program script, again, not the most meaningful message. But what it does do is give you an, an, the ability to document when you made changes and why, what the thinking behind them was. Um, and even better, you can easily compare changes between different versions. So you can see here, I have an earlier and an up-to-date version of the Jupyter Notebook containing the life expectancy analysis. And on the left here, you can see in the older version, I hadn't written the introductory text, but in the up-to-date version, I had. So it clearly marks where that change has been made and highlights in green and red, which are the sections that have been changed. So we now get to our final section. Who needs to access our analysis and how can we easily get it to them? So the traditional method that I am still guilty of using of sharing documents involves attaching it to an email. Um, so you might put your Word document, paste some code or attach a code file and send it to all your collaborators. And then what you might get back is some changes to your code or a Word document with track changes if you're lucky. And then you need to sit down and integrate those changes manually into your work. And it can be a real pain. <coughs> In addition, it's actually really difficult to keep track of who made what changes, which is problematic if some sort of change comes up that you don't really understand and you can't actually go back to the person who made it. So I have another solution for you to this issue, of course. So remember how I spoke about remote repos in the last section? 
Well, remote repos are web-based project folders that can be accessed by multiple people. So there are a number of sites that allow for the use of remote repos, but one of the most popular, and obviously the one that I use, is called GitHub. So GitHub has a bunch of functions, but for this talk, let's have a look at how it can be used for simplified and more importantly, documentable collaboration. Okay, so we have our remote project repo with the current version of our analysis script here. So I'm the owner of this repo, and I come in and I make a change to the script on the bottom left there. I commit this change, and I push it to the remote repo. As earlier, the current analysis script now contains the change I made, but it keeps track of the old version as well. So now my collaborator comes in. She clones this remote repo from GitHub, which creates her own local repo and her own machine. She then makes her change. As she has permission to make changes to this repo, she can push her changes and have them integrated with my script. So her version now becomes the current version of the analysis script, and the two previous versions are then stored as snapshots. So a really important part of collaborating using GitHub is that the contributions of each author are tracked. As I said, that's an issue when you're trying to manually integrate things. So it's really important to have this um, kept track of if someone's made a really confusing change and you need to go and query them for justification as to why they made it. So you can see in this example that GitHub marks who contributed what really clearly. So at the bottom, you can see the latest commit that I made to the project. And above that, we've got the contribution that my collaborator made. All right, so let's recap everything we've covered about reproducible research in Python and R. OK, so let's start with our first question. What did I do? In an irreproducible analysis, what we'll have is in-progress scripts that have a bunch of defunct code and a bunch of steps that we haven't documented that have been done manually. In a reproducible analysis, we'll have a tidy script that documents all steps such as data downloads and data processing. Why did I do it? In an irreproducible analysis, we won't document the thinking behind our analysis properly. Whereas in a reproducible analysis, we can make use of tools like um, literate programming tools such as Jupyter Notebooks or our Markdown document to clearly document what our um, thinking was. How did I set it up? In an irreproducible analysis, we system install all of our packages into the global environment. Whereas in a reproducible analysis, we make use of things like virtual or packwrap to create isolated environments. When did I make changes? In an irreproducible analysis, we'll have multiple scripts and we'll have no clear idea of what is useful code when we made changes. Whereas in a reproducible analysis, we use version control to make sure we track our changes and the thinking behind them. And who needs to access it, which is an optional step, but generally extremely important in research projects. Um, in an irreproducible analysis, we'll email the, the collaborators and manually integrate all of their feedback and changes. In a reproducible analysis, we use code sharing websites such as GitHub to at least get their feedback integrated in things like um, our Markdown or Jupyter Notebooks. And that is it. We have loads of time for questions and also for people to like shout out with their own opinions on what they do and what they like. So, does anyone want to ask questions? Thanks so much. That was really great. I was just interested in the um, the global environments and those, mm. the pack rat things. Um, say I got asked you, I know I've got a package already on my machine. I set up a pack rat environment. Yeah. Do I need to sort of reinstall that within there or is it okay? So there isn't some way to go to look from the global environment. And, and you kind of don't want to. Like, I know some can take a lot of time to download, but you want to make sure that the version that you're using is kind of the latest version, if you know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Like, you want to make sure you're doing a clean install and not pulling in old oh. history. So think of it as though, think of a packet environment or a virtual environment as though you have a brand new computer and you've just opened it for the first time and you're starting up after the first time. That makes it easy for me. Sometimes end up with multiple installations. Like, even if it's exactly the same version. Yeah. Um, <coughs> you can. So, yeah, you would if you've got multiple. Um, yeah. 
multiple pack rat projects. Um, yeah, thanks. That was great. Really nice to see an overview. Um, I think the most difficult part is often the, the sharing. Um, I was talking about working with collaborators or you know, colleagues, supervisors who are not familiar with this, this process and, and will not be convinced that they need to work as familiars. And then you're, you're stuck with doing that. Do you have any suggestions? <laughs> I think, okay, so as Harriet said, so my background is psychology. I wasn't a technical person at all. And I think a lot of this stuff really freaked me out. Like, it seemed overwhelming. Um, and once you realise how easy it is, I think maybe that's part of breaking it down. I know some academics are never going to be convinced and you'll have to make do. Um, but, yeah, maybe... The only real way is education. Just say, look, it's really simple. You just need to type a couple of commands. Or, or our studio can actually do git commits for you now. You just need to click this button and type a message about what you changed. Um, other than changing kind of the entire culture around it, I think you're never going to convince some supervisors. Their workflow is set and it's been set for 40 years and it's never going to change. There's a few intermediate steps, like there's a git has a graphical user interface that you can use instead of the command line, if it's mm. the command line bit that is freaking people out, so that's something that GitHub produces, I think. Ah, oh, got you. Um, and there's also, if like, you're doing very specific tasks, so let's say you're just writing a paper, um, there's tools like Authoria, um, which are like web interfaces, and they kind of hide all the committing stuff, so it's like a Git repository at the back end, but there's like text boxes and clicking as sort of the main interaction, mm. so those are some things that we're trying to like get people on board, even if they don't what yeah. yeah, that actually, I think the more you can kind of present it to them in a way that works with the way that they're used to working and they don't have to learn a whole bunch of new stuff, I think that's the way to go. Just to add to that, I, um, I think some of the tools that you mentioned are quite easy to use, but some of them are not well, maybe not for everyone. So if I, if I am a competition, I often have to look up git commands. It's, it's not intuitive if you're not using it you know, multiple times a day. So and, and I, I, I guess sometimes it might be a mistake to tell people, like, oh, this is really easy, you're going to get it first time because then they feel very um, demoralised. <laughs> when, when they find <laughs> it difficult. But, yeah. but pointing them, I don't know, maybe writing some instructions for them or mm -hmm. pointing them to some, some easy tutorial so they can go back and refer to you might find it. Yeah, and I suppose you get into the whole thing of the like clashes when you've got two different versions that have conflicts. Okay. Yes, that is a whole different issue. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Oh. <laughs> um, uh, you talked about R and Markdown and R Studio. I was wondering if you had used R and the Jupyter Notebook and what your No, I haven't got. Like, I know you can install the R kernel and the Julia kernel. Um, I haven't quite gotten that far. But um, I haven't seen, I was rummaging around. This is just me talking about something I've never used. Um, I have seen that you can use magic commands if you do have the R kernel um, installed to actually run R and Python <coughs> as itself. It's quite cool. Anyway, I haven't been there. That's messy sometimes. Okay, okay, cool. I'm not, I'm not going to sell you on that then. I haven't, I haven't been there. The about that is the next Mm. I've seen those. Ah. So they're coming out with. I, I saw it on Twitter. And yeah. I, I opened a web page about it and read the first three lines and then I closed it. So <laughs> as much as I've read to our notebooks. Yeah, I had a question about GitHub. Uh, as I understand, uh, if you just open up a regular GitHub account, then it, anything you do will be publicly accessible. Is yeah. That right? um, um, I don't have a private account, um, yeah. but I think private accounts cost about six dollars a month. So. Very, very and academics can apply for them as well. So if you're like doing teaching or stuff like that, there's like a 
various things you can apply for that let you get, I think, mean, five free. Five free. Okay. There's also um, GitHub Git. Um, Another mm. distribution stream, yeah. which can be private. Yeah. I think there's possibly a few restrictions about it, but it's private. Yeah. And, and you get institutional ones as well. Like you can like host your own GitHub, sort of, and then you can sort of have it as your own private area if you want to like. <coughs> is that what GitLab is? Yeah. Yeah. So we have that at our institute. And just people do it internally. Has anyone tried writing something really long with Jupyter or Markdown? Yes. <laughs> awesome. Uh, yeah. I think I heard someone else. Yeah. Just the yeah, um, the dodge of analysis and the analysis of analysis. Yeah. Yeah. I find uh, it's actually quite easy to work with Markdown. Yeah. I think, oh, sorry. No, I think it is easy. Um, yeah, it's easier to keep track of what you've done. Mm -hmm. I use mind maps as well to try to do that, but that has it all in, for me, like in a nicer format. Yeah. So. I thought the point about um, the importance of tidying up your code at the end and not keeping your dead ends is um, it's really true. And it's, it's one I psychologically struggled with a little bit. Um, I spent hours writing, <laughs> thinking out how to do this plot with things on strings instead of box plots, which I love, and nobody else does, but they said, no, put box plots back. Yes. <laughs> do you have any advice on, on how you manage the useful snippets that you spent hours making and nobody wants? Trick you back on later? I won't say I have a great system. I have a file called useful code. I think <laughs> maybe we all have one of those. Um, I do have plans of going back and subdividing it into different topics. Um, something though that in theory I think could work is having your your version control and basically because you delete things and it's keeping track of what you delete, you can kind of go, I know in that analysis I actually wrote that really sweet plot function. I'm going to go back and look at my commit history and then you can find it. It's not the easiest way of keeping track of it though. But if you write in your commit confession, commit message something about it, could be. But I have to say I haven't really come up with a super great system. I've got a nice big chunky R markdown file with really rubbish explanations. Uh, I want to say on that, uh, GitHub has, if you use GitHub has a thing called GIST, which is like a repository, but instead of being a full file, it's just a single file of code. Um, so sometimes people use that for putting up, here's a selling idea that's not actually a piece of software, it's just a little bit of code that does something they want to share or remember. So it still has all the same version of job stuff. That is actually a really good idea. Yes. I would say go with GIS. <laughs> and on that as well, for me, it's not as sophisticated, but I use my maps and I have um, like this is the graphical functions that I use and I put like keywords um, and it's all in one document so um, it's easy to find. Yeah. I wanted to comment on virtual environments. You oh, mentioned yes. Anaconda and yes. um, so I use Condo which is the environment management for Anaconda um, and it pretty much works exactly the way you described. One cool thing that it does, which is perhaps rare in some other environments, is that it lets you install dependencies that are not Python. Mm. So, for example, let's say I have a, a piece of Python code that depends on Blast and Sand Tools and whatever, and this happens to me all the time because often the Python packages are actually calling to, you know, C tools. Um, you can actually install them as dependencies. Um, and then it all gets packaged up. <coughs> um, you can do stuff like send, I can send somebody uh, like an environment file um, in, in the way that you showed up in Python, except it's also have, it must have sample version to one point, whatever, um, which I quite like. Will that also keep track of versions of data files, like use placement 
No. Unless we've got a thousand hackers from now. But then I guess Data files are tricky, right? Because you can say, well, you can go to Git, but then once they reach the order of megabytes and Git repositories can only be what two Git, um, you get into the trouble there. So, um, at least for data, there's a few like more like data sharing tools, like if it's sort of data that you can make a copy of, you can go and post it somewhere. Um, uh, Figshare does that. So you can be like, okay, well, I've made this version of data. Any other questions? Or just, thoughts? just one other quick thing. Uh, I've been trying to do it myself, but I haven't really implemented it in any of my code. Have you ever done testing or run things like Travis through um, GitHub? No, no. So the uh, the idea behind it is when you're writing code, uh, for every function you write in your code, you write a test. A test case which will run automatically, and then in GitHub you can enable something called Travis, which apparently every time you make a commit will actually run your tests, oh. which is really useful. So that way you you know if you're going to break your code if you make that change right away. That is really useful. Really elegant. <coughs> yeah, it's it's really neat, but I, as I say, I haven't really implemented myself yet. Good intentions. Yeah. Are you using? Yeah. 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 You know, it's, it's interesting. So my partner's a developer. And um, obviously, software development has a lot of best practices that I think we're kind of starting to learn. And I think that's kind of part of the problem. Like, unit testing is a standard in software development. And I kind of like, I'm like, I know I need to unit test. So how do I put the unit test into my workflow? Like, where does it fit? So yeah, I think the more we kind of talk about this and build up kind of best practices in the community, the better we all get. And I will say, like, you can see I'm still learning. There's things I haven't heard of. Um, kind of fumbling my way through this as well, so. Anything else? Plenty of time for more questions at the pub as well. Okay. Um, could we, uh, so I just wanted to give you a little present to say thank you. Well, thank for you so much. Spending the evening with us and talking about all your experiences. Um, we're going to be having drinks at the Clyde, which is just like a five minute walk up there and then right. And you can kind of, anyone who's welcome to come along and we'll you know, have some snacks and et cetera. Nerd it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and keep chatting about this. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for speaking to us. Um, and if we could all thank Jodie again. Yeah.